In our third and final segment on the physics of light, we will pursue the physics trail in answering two questions: What would it be like to be the Invisible Man? And how can you measure something as fast as the speed of light? The Invisible Man. It has been the topic of hundreds of stories, books, poems, and movies. What would it be like to be the Invisible Man? Why is it that light goes through glass and water, but doesn't go through other materials? Glass is made up of three materials: sand, soda ash, and limestone. Three very non-transparent materials. At nearly three thousand degrees, these materials fuse together, and once cooled and solidified, they form a new solid material, which, incredibly, visible light goes through. By the way, there is a persistent myth that glass is actually a slow-moving liquid, but glass is a solid and not a slow-moving liquid. Some windows found in early colonial American homes are thicker at the bottom than at the top, and you will often hear people claim that the glass is slowly moving downward because it's a thick liquid. But if that was the case, if the bottom is thicker because in 250 years the glass has slowly moved down like cold honey, then glass bottles and dishes found in ancient Rome should be a little glass puddle by now, but they aren't. They are still bottles and dishes, and if glass is actually slowly moving at this speed, then antique instruments with precision glass lenses should be completely out of focus by now. The glass should have run down, ruining their optical usefulness. But this hasn't happened. Precision antique lenses, which are much finer and often thinner than colonial windows. Are still perfectly in focus and working flawlessly, because once glass is solidified, it simply doesn't flow anymore. Before modern flat glass manufacturing processes, these early windows were created by spinning molten glass to try to make a round, flat plate. The window was then cut from that round plate. The result of spinning molten glass forced more glass toward the edges, producing a slightly thicker edge. After it was cut, the thickest edge was often, but not always, placed down for stability. Sometimes you can find windows with the thicker side at the top. Glass needs to be heated to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit to be worked, and it stops flowing at about 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, glass in windows. Is very stable. Here are a group of atoms, and the tiny electrons, which you cannot see at this level, are clouding around each atom. And when a vibrating light wave interacts with the particular electrons of an atom, which are able to resonate at the same frequency, that light energy is passed completely into the electrons and dissipates as heat. And is never seen as light again. This is light absorption. Or, if the light is at a different frequency, it may cause a momentary electron energy change, but the atom will reject the energy frequency and return the light wave at the same or selected frequencies that it came in at. Maybe only red will be rejected, and the other colors will be absorbed. This. Is light reflection and allows us to see all the solid or opaque objects around us. But what if the light does not vibrate with the same frequency? That is, it is neither absorbed nor reflected. What happens then? In that case, the light waves will quickly pass their energy from atom to atom. Until it is retransmitted back out with the same frequency or color that it came in with, the energy will not be absorbed and dissipated into heat. Rather, 
it is retransmitted back out and your eye sees that retransmitted light wave. And that is the theory of how light passes through some materials. If it resonates with the material, it is dissipated as heat and you can't see through it. But if it doesn't resonate with the material, the light wave passes through and we call those materials transparent. Light particles do not resonate with glass and therefore are not wasted as heat. Rather, almost 95% of the light waves are passed from atom to atom until it is almost completely refracted back out of the glass and we get to see those light waves. Here's another way to look at it. Imagine if you had a camera on one side of a solid wall and you hook up a TV monitor on the other side. The camera picks up light waves on this side and retransmits the information through a cable to the monitor on the other side. In effect, you get to see through the wall. Glass works almost identically like that. One side of the glass picks up light wave energy similar to the camera. Glass is as solid as any other wall. Since it doesn't resonate with the atoms in the glass, it is quickly passed from atom to atom like that cable until it gets out the other side of the wall. Like seeing the monitor, you see the light waves that were just on the other side of a solid wall similar to the camera and the monitor. That's how the glass wall works. We call glass walls windows. The brick wall, on the other hand, is made of very different molecules. Visible light energy resonates very well with them. As the light waves interact with the trillions and trillions of electrons in the brick, a lot of the energy passes completely into those atoms. The brick atoms now vibrate with greater intensity, producing heat. The heat quickly dissipates into the surrounding material, and those light waves are never seen again. Some of the light is retransmitted as reflected light, which is why you can see the surface of the brick wall at all. If very few of the brick's electrons resonated, the light waves would quickly pass from atom to atom out the other side and the brick wall would look completely transparent, just like a window. Generally, all of the colors of the visible spectrum get through glass. They all pass through. Once you get to the far side of the visible light spectrum, violet, the next frequency over is ultraviolet or superviolet. The sun produces ultraviolet as well as visible light. This is a photo of the ultraviolet light produced by the sun and then it is altered so you can actually see the image. Our eyes are not tuned to be able to see this next energy level to see ultraviolet light, even though it is very much there. But some of the ultraviolet waves resonate with ordinary glass, meaning that the ultraviolet light waves transfer their energy into the glass molecules and the ultraviolet doesn't pass through. Now here you can see part of ultraviolet getting through the glass, and we will talk more about that in a moment. The far ends of the visible light spectrum are invisible to our eyes. Right past red is infrared, and past violet is ultraviolet. But some animals can see these lights. Goldfish can see infrared. Bees and birds and lizards have eyes that can see all the way over to ultraviolet. Some night vision glasses take the invisible ends of the light spectrum, infrared and ultraviolet, and convert it over to light that we can see. That's what thermal imaging is. They take the energy that things emit 
and pull it over to the visible spectrum through these electronic glasses so you can see the energy radiating off. Other night vision glasses can take a tiny amount of visible light near pitch dark and electronically amplify it so you can see at night. Though not impossible, it is more difficult to get a sunburn through window glass since glass absorbs most ultraviolet rays. Ultraviolet rays are high intensity rays and they are responsible for bleaching out the colors in posters and your hair and in plastics. UV rays are often broken down into subcategories of UVA and UVB. Ultraviolet A will penetrate deeper into your skin, causing long-term aging and wrinkling, and UVB penetrates the top skin, causing sunburns. UVA will age you. UVB will burn you. Window glass in homes and cars will block nearly 95% of UVB, but Ultraviolet A passes right through window glass. Ultraviolet B is largely responsible for fading colors in posters and carpets and cloth and in degrading plastics. It's called photodegradation. The ultraviolet rays vibrate at such high energy that they break down the molecular bonds in pigments and plastics. As a result, the plastics deteriorate and the pigments fade because the UV rays have destroyed the bonds that made most of the colors except the blues, since ultraviolet is on the blue end of the visible light spectrum. This ability for visible light to pass through some materials at different speeds is called the refractive index, which we saw earlier. If you can get two materials together with the same refractive index, one of them will look nearly invisible as light passes through both of them at the same speed. For example, these tiny plastic spheres are a kind of superabsorbent plastic. They are also called hydrogels or liquid marbles. They are originally little crystals and then they absorb over 200 times their weight in water and turn into this form, jelly marbles, which are now 99% water. Thus, they have nearly the exact same refractive index as water. So when you put them in water, they become almost invisible. It looks almost magical, but really, it's just as if I said, watch as I take this tablespoon of water and dump it inside this glass of water. It will disappear. Well, you wouldn't be too impressed. The impressive part is that the water is actually retained in a fairly solid shape from the plastic around it. And that is what disappears and impresses us. Likewise, this Pyrex glass rod has a different light refractive index than water does. When you put it in the water, the light refracts or bends, and you can clearly see it. But Wesson oil has a very close index of refraction as Pyrex glass. Now the rod disappears. Light refracts between two mediums like air and glass or air and water. But if the angle is steep enough, the light won't refract off, but it will reflect back inside, being virtually trapped inside the medium, almost never getting out. This is basically how a fiber optic cable works. This is a fiber optic or glass cable. When you shine a light into it, it guides the light wave all the way down the cable to the other end, sort of like a garden hose for light. When the index of refraction of the air is a lot less than the liquid or the glass, 
and the angle is steep enough, the light can't get out, and it experiences total internal reflection. You can see the first reflection here, the second and the third totally reflecting inside, and the light can't get out. The fiber is actually a very pure glass with a sort of mirror outer coating that keeps the light bouncing down the glass fiber. The glass can carry the signal several miles before it needs a booster to keep the signal inside the glass fiber. Fiber optic cables are laid all over the world's oceans to carry millions of phone calls per second. This is a piece of undersea fiber optic cable. All this metal and the plastic sheathing protects the tiny colored fibers that you can see here. By sending rapidly pulsed light signals bounding down the cable, each one of these glass fibers can handle tens of thousands of simultaneous calls. This internal reflection is also why diamonds sparkle so much. Light travels in a diamond at less than half the speed it moves through the air in your room. Jewelers take advantage of this by cutting and polishing the rough diamond, producing sparkling facets. These facets not only reflect light, but their steep angles temporarily trap the light inside. The more the light bounces around inside before leaving, the more it separates into the rainbow spectrum, producing the dazzling sparkle of a diamond. Typically, the light will undergo several total internal reflections before finally refracting out of the diamond. Lasers have been around for well over 50 years, yet lasers still seem like the stuff of science fiction. Every day, we depend on lasers in the grocery store barcode scanners, and in your DVD player, where a laser reads the disc information. Laser surgery happens tens of thousands of times every day, improving eyesight or removing unwanted hair or unwanted tattoos. Regular light is made up of all the wavelengths of the visible light spectrum, scattering off everywhere, allowing you to see things. Even if you shine it through a red filter, it's still scattering off of everything. What if you could increase the amount of just the red light and get all of those wavelengths working together? Then maybe you'd have something. If you flash a high intensity light, like ultraviolet light or quartz flash bulb on red beads, not much happens. But if you shine it on a ruby, the gem will emit its characteristic bright red color. If you put a rod of ruby and the flash bulb inside a little box with mirrors at each end, the red light will bounce back and forth. As the flash bulb produces ruby red light, the light trapped in between these tiny mirrors will resonate with yet more ruby atoms, stimulating even more red light emission. When intense enough, the amplified red light will burst out of one of the mirrors, which is actually a tiny two-way mirror. The light that escapes is highly amplified and tight and red and all going in the same direction now. It's amplified because the mirrors force the red light itself to stimulate emission of even more red light. And since visible light, including red light, is just a form of electromagnetic radiation, they call this device a laser. Light amplification, bouncing back and forth between mirrors, by the stimulated emission, red light making more red light, of radiation, the light itself. A laser. Measurements between the moon and the earth are regularly made by bouncing a laser off mirror reflectors on the moon left there by Apollo astronauts to make measurements. 
The round trip from the observatory to the moon and back takes about two and a half seconds. Even with tight, coherent laser light, the laser beam grows to over four miles wide by the time it hits the moon. And out of the countless light particles sent out by the laser to the moon, only one every few seconds makes it back to the detector on Earth. A laser can be as small as a microscopic computer chip or as immense as the National Ignition Facility, which is three football fields wide. Lasers today come in multiple colors and can produce continuous streams of amplified light. Laser beams are a famous mainstay as science fiction weapons. But actual laser weapons are still in the experimental stage. Or at least that's the official story. Light can also produce literal optical illusions. Images that really exist but are different than the things that created them. Literal optical illusions are different than the optical illusions that fool your eye or that your brain creates. Like these famous optical illusions of impossible objects. Notice how the middle prong of the fork goes nowhere. And the famous Penrose staircase, which goes endlessly in a circle. Or the famous barber pole illusion, where diagonal stripes slowly spin, giving the illusion that the stripes are moving upward forever. Even movies are an optical illusion, where many slightly varied still pictures are shown in rapid succession and are interpreted by your brain as a moving picture. Now, none of these illusions are really happening the way you think they're happening. They simply fool your brain into thinking that they are real. But literal optical illusions are images that actually exist. And they include mirages, where light is refracted or bent, causing images from a distant horizon to appear closer, much like our penny in the cup. Or like hot road mirages, where fake water appears on hot asphalt. This is caused when cool air above the hot air on the road surface creates layers or a gradient in the refractive index of the air. The different refractive layers shimmer, looking like water. This kind of gradient mirage is probably the explanation for the famous Marfa light that are found near the town of Marfa, Texas. For over 50 years, reports of basketball-sized shimmering lights in the hills and surrounding area of Marfa occur maybe 20 times a year in the evening. They have even built a viewing platform so you can possibly get a sighting of the lights. No definitive explanation has emerged but the most likely suspect is car headlights from US-67 refracting through gradient air into the viewing area, very much like the hot road mirage. A similar mirage sometimes causes the setting summer sun to look flattened, especially at the ocean. The light from the lower part of the sun is traveling through a thicker, hotter, and more dense layer of air than the top part. The result is a lens effect causing the light to refract or bend and squishes the lower light. This is similar to the pencil refracting in a glass of water. And why does the moon often look larger on the horizon than it does in the sky? Believe it or not, they have been debating the famous moon illusion for centuries, especially since when you measure the moon and the horizon, then measure it in the sky, they are identical. So it has nothing to do with atmospheric refraction. To a large degree, the scientific explanation for this monthly optical phenomena is still a mystery. So on to the invisible man. If you were the invisible man, your body would have the same refractive index as air, or at least 
your body would resonate with none of the light waves and would pass every one of them through, very similar to a window. The DC comic character Superman possesses X-ray vision, and he uses it to see bad guys through walls. But here's a thought. As we've seen, the eye works because light reflects through the transparent cornea, through the transparent lens, and is projected onto the back of the retina inside your eye. X-rays normally pass right through the back of our eyes, so Superman would need a special eye to collect X-rays. Also, there aren't a lot of X-rays bouncing around the planet, so his eyes would also have to produce X-rays, and then those rays which didn't pass right through things would have to bounce back to his eye in order for him to see them. Which leads us back to our original question, what would it be like to be the Invisible Man? Well, to be the Invisible Man, everything about you is transparent, meaning you have the exact same refractive index as air. This means your eyes are also transparent. Since your retina is completely transparent, the light waves would never refract and reflect on the retina in your eye. The light waves would pass right through your head. So not only could nobody ever see you, but as the invisible man, you would also be completely blind. Light travels fast, really fast. In fact, it almost looks instantaneous. For hundreds of years, the best minds in science thought that light was instantaneous, while the other best minds in science thought that light had to travel at some speed. Rumor has it that Galileo and his assistant each took a shuttered lantern and stood on hilltops one mile apart. Galileo flashed his lantern, and the assistant would open the shutter to his own lantern the instant he saw Galileo's light. Galileo would then time how long it took for the round trip. That was the plan, anyway, but he just wasn't fast enough on the timer. So Galileo figured that if light did travel, it must travel very, very fast indeed. In fact, it is fast. In the vacuum of space, light travels almost 700 million miles an hour. And how fast is that? Well, your eye blinking takes 300,000 microseconds. In Galileo's experiment, light made the round trip in only 11 microseconds. Galileo never had a chance. With something traveling that fast, how in the world could you possibly measure it? Today, we have all kinds of high-tech equipment that can accurately measure the speed of light. But after Galileo, and before we had electricity in our homes, at least two men accurately measured the speed of light using their eyes, their minds, and the stuff around them. Incredibly, the first accurate measurement of the speed of light was taken over 300 years ago by the Danish astronomer Ole Romer. How in the world did he do that? Jupiter is a gigantic planet, and one of its moons, Io, is traveling very fast, 17 times faster than our own moon, and it makes the trip around giant Jupiter in just 42 and a half hours, fast enough that you can actually watch its motion during a single night of observation. Especially useful is when you see Io dart behind Jupiter and then re-emerge on the other side. Back in Romer's day, astronomers were looking for a very predictable and precise astronomical event to serve as a cosmic clock to help ships at sea navigate more accurately. The regular timing of this eclipse between Jupiter and the moon Io might be just what they were looking for. Through observations taken over five or six years, 
Romer soon found that when the Earth was here, the closest to Jupiter, the eclipse would happen at about 7 o'clock p.m., say. But six months later, when the Earth was furthest from Jupiter, over here, the eclipse happened 16 and a half minutes later. Then, when the Earth came back around six months from then, the eclipses were back on time. Romer concluded that the eclipse was actually happening on time in both places, but when Earth was furthest from Jupiter, it took the light a whopping 16 and a half extra minutes to cross the huge distance of Earth's orbit and finally show up in the observatory telescope. Thus, compared to six months earlier, the eclipse looked like it was late by about a thousand seconds or 16 and a half minutes. Look here. The diameter of Earth's orbit is 186 million miles. If it took 1,000 seconds to travel that distance, then light must be traveling at 186,000 miles every second. Naturally, many of the best astronomers disagreed because they determined that the speed of light was infinite, instantaneous, and that the longer time was probably caused from Io having an odd, wobbling orbit. But within 50 years, other methods were developed to measure the speed of light, showing that Romer's calculations were indeed correct. Actually, Romer thought the time delay was closer to 20 or 22 minutes instead of the 16 and a half minutes, but he was certainly within the ballpark. And for the first time, and quite by accident, the speed of light had been measured. The second man was Armand Fizeau, and he was the first person to measure the speed of light as it travels right here on Earth. Similar to the Galileo experiment, with which he was familiar, he set up two stations about five miles apart in Paris. Then he used something really simple and brilliant. One of these, a toothed wheel. It looks like a gear. He set up a beam of light to shoot through the notch and reflect off the mirror back to his eye. Starting to spin the wheel, the light would then turn on and off, on and off. But the faster the wheel spun, something started to happen. It looked like a door was starting to close on the light. It was because the beam of light was no longer coming back through the same notch, but was starting to hit the next tooth. By spinning the wheel fast enough, he completely blocked the light. Calculating the distance between the stations, the speed of the wheel, and the number of notches in the wheel, Fizeau accurately calculated the speed of light to within 5% of the actual value, and he did this in 1849. Modern physics is built around the idea that light is the fastest thing in the universe, the absolute top limit, and everything else must bend around that. We will see the ramifications of this idea later on in the Physics of the Weird segment.